Thanks very much, Bruce. And I uh, wanted to echo um, uh, Maeve Reed and thanking all of you for coming this evening. It's really wonderful to see uh, such a good uh, turnout. Um, our speaker tonight, uh, Shelley Watsman, one of the things you'll notice about him is that he does not, he's an archaeologist, but he really doesn't have a very good tan. And uh, <laughs> that's because he is a specialist uh, in underwater archaeology. Um, <laughs> there are other downsides to that, too. Um, but uh, uh, Shelley Waxman was uh, born in Canada and uh, moved to Israel in 1968. He received his BA, MA, and PhD from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem in 1990. And uh, he became uh, one of the, I believe, the first inspector of underwater antiquities for the Israel Department of uh, Antiquities of Museums and carried out numerous uh, uh, projects of underwater archaeology in both the Mediterranean and uh, the Sea of Galilee. So he spent uh, a large chunk of his career in Israel and then uh, more uh, recently at the uh, Institute for Nautical Archaeology uh, at uh, Texas A&M. Um, Dr. Waxman has um, uh, published four books and over 60 articles um, arising out of his field research and he's really one of the leading figures in um, nautical archaeology. He's written a book on the Sea of Galilee Boat, an extraordinary 2,000-year-old discovery. His fourth book, uh, Seagoing Ships and Seamanship in the Bronze Age Levant, uh, came out in 1998. And these have been award-winning um, uh, books that he's, he has this real gift of communicating highly technical knowledge in a very, very clear and effective way, as, as you will see. Uh, one of the nice uh, uh, things about Dr. Waxman is he's worked at really every end of the Mediterranean, so that he's worked uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean off the coast of Israel. He's worked off the coast of Greece trying to track the lost remains of the Persian fleet that attacked Greece during the Persian Wars. And he's worked at the very outside, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, is that what you would call it, the Straits of Gibraltar, in uh, Portugal, looking at very early um, uh, Phoenician colonies and uh, uh, the remains of uh, the, the uh, Phoenician seafaring uh, as well. So this is really an extraordinary career, a man with tremendous uh, expertise, and we're, we're very honored to have him with us uh, here tonight talking about one of his more interesting uh, discoveries. This would be freshwater nautical archaeology and his, um, his research on covering the uh, Sea of Galilee boat. So please join me in welcome. Good evening, and thanks so much for coming out tonight. Um, as you've heard, I spent a lot of time in Israel, and now I've been in Texas for almost 20 years, so I like to open every lecture by saying, Shalom, you all. <laughs> and I can say that and mean it. What I'm going to do tonight, basically this lecture is, is divided into two parts. There's an adventure story and a detective story. We're going to start out with the adventure story. This is about a very unique boat. The adventure takes place here in the Middle East, in Israel, in, at the Sea of Galilee. Now the Sea of Galilee is, well it's called a sea, but actually, as you've just heard, it's a freshwater inland lake. And it's Israel's main source of uh, fresh water. And the adventure actually takes place right here on the west coast of the Sea of Galilee. Um, this is the location of the site. Now, before we uh, begin talking about the ship, the boat, I'd like to show you three images very well known from Christian art, and I want you to look closely at the boats in these uh, paintings. This is, first of all, Raphael's The Miraculous Draft of Fishes. Then we have Rembrandt's Storm on the Sea of Galilee and Delacroix's Christ on the Lake of Gennesaret. So when we look at all three of these boats, what do they have in common? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Nobody had a clue as to what these boats looked like. Uh, anyone who's familiar with the Gospels, Jesus' ministry took place more, almost entirely on the Sea of Galilee with a backdrop of fishing and seafaring and uh, boats. But the truth is we knew nothing about what these boats looked like up until 1986. At that time, there was a drought in the Near East, and 
As the drought continued, water from the Sea of Galilee, or as it's known in Hebrew, the Kinneret, K-I-N-N-E-R-E-T, um, the Kinneret is also the uh, main reservoir of fresh water for Israel. So as the drought went on, water was being pumped out of the lake for various uses. And because the, the Kinneret is a very shallow lake, uh, vast expanses of seabed uh, were revealed. At the time, I was inspector of underwater antiquities, and uh, I got a message in January of uh, 1986, February, I'm sorry, of 1986, that a boat, possibly ancient, had been found in the Sea of Galilee. So I threw my dive tanks and dive gear into the Jeep and drove out to the Sea of Galilee to meet the two brothers who had found this vessel. Well, I got out there, and uh, they were telling me about it, but they, were kinda, they weren't telling me exactly where it was. So I said, let's go out to the site and look at it. Well, we get out to the site, and here we're standing on the, the, this area of mud that had been the seabed, and I asked Yuvi, that's one of the two brothers who's standing there, and I said, uh, where's the boat? And I was, as I was saying that, I was pulling my tank out of the, the, the uh, Jeep and about to put on my regulator, and he said, well, actually, you're standing on it. <clears throat> well, that, uh, that sort of surprised me um, because the question now was we opened up a, um, what you could see was just this line of wood in the mud, anything that had been above the sediment layer had disintegrated. So what we had it was a line of mud that you could see was the side of a hull. And they asked me, could this be an ancient boat or is it modern? Because then another archaeologist had been there before and he just looked at it and said, oh, this is a modern boat. Well, I said, what we have to do is look at how it's built. And here I'll give you a short introduction to how constru ancient hull construction. It won't be painful. Um, let's say we're building a, a boat today or a ship. If we're not doing it out of fiberglass, how do we normally build it? Well, we will lay down a keel. Then a stem post and a stern post, and to that we will attach what in correct nautical parlance are frames, but they're sometimes called ribs also. In other words, you're building up a skeletal structure or a frame-based structure, which give both the strength to the hull and the shape of the hull, and very much like a human skeleton. And we call this frame-based construction. But we know that in antiquities, in antiquity, they did things differently. They would build up first the shell of the hull, the planks. They would attach the planks one to the, to the other. And then only at the end, they would add the frames. And in this case, what you have is both the shape and the strength of the hull is based on the planking and the connections between the planks without the frames playing into that. The frames are added later for a little extra strengthening. Um, and this is known as shell-based construction. And in this sense, it's rather like a, an insect's exoskeleton. Now, when they attached the planks one to the other, they did not use nails. They used more, what we called pegged mortise and tenon joinery. And if you have some very high quality um, wood, woodcraft in your house, you might have some, sometimes this is still used today, but it's very laborious and it's uh, very expensive to use. And the only reason they could do it in antiquity is because they had slaves. And it went out of use when, slaves, when slavery went out of uh, style. So how does mortise and tenon, uh, ten, tenon joinery work? You, let's say you have a generic, we have a generic ship here or boat with the bottom plank that's already on the hull you start cutting mortises or these uh, slots into the upper edge of the uh, highest plank. You then insert a hardwood tenon, uh, a little slip of wood. Um, you put it ha so that half of it is in this mortise. And you do this every so many centimeters along the plank so that the plank in the end looks sort of like it's got teeth. Then you bring the next uh, plank and you cut opposing mortises to half the height of the tenons on it. You then close the two planks together so that the uh, tenons are half in one, half in the other, and then you drill. This is really a laborious uh, pro uh, prospect. You then drill holes, usually from the inside out and uh, through the planking and the tenon and then you bang in wooden pegs, and that's what's called peg mortise and tenon joinery. 
Now, uh, when you have completed this process, you can sometimes still see, and I've had students build little mock-ups of two planks with mortise and tenon joinery, and you can still, no matter how good you do it, you can still see light coming through the seam. You think that's a good idea if you want to sail the ship in the sea? Not a good idea. So what did they do? I like feedback, so what did they do? What? Caulking. I, that's what everybody says, but actually they did not use caulking. What they did was they put the boat or the ship in the water. The, wa the boat, the vessel started sinking, and then the wood swelled, forming a watertight joint. And at that point, it, in this type of construction, one of the hallmarks of this uh, type of construction is they do not use caulking. The reason I tell you all that is when the brothers asked me, is this an ancient boat? I said, well, let's see if it has mortise and tenon joints in it. Because we know, at least in the Mediterranean, nobody had ever found a boat in the Sea of Galilee. But we know in the Mediterranean that that exists at least to the end of the Roman period. It starts going out of style around the 5th, 6th century AD. So we opened up a small area of, the uppermost, of that uppermost plank. And that scale is 20 centimeters. And immediately, we could see the mortise and tenon scars, and here are the heads of the pegs. So we knew, like that, this is an ancient boat. We didn't know exactly how ancient it was, but we knew that this was ancient. Well, at this point, I love to, uh, I love to tell the story. Um, this was in February. It was very cold, very rainy. Just as we are suddenly standing there realizing not only are we discovering history, we're also making it, because this is the first ancient boat ever found in the Sea of Galilee. We had this huge rainstorm, just, you know, the, the sky opened up. We ran for the Jeep, got into the Jeep, and five minutes later, the rain stopped. We came out, and we had these two beautiful rainbows over the Sea of Galilee. It was like they were ordered by central casting. <laughs> and UV, one of the brother there standing on the left, uh, hit me in the ribs and said, well, now we know who this boat belonged to. And I said, who's that? <laughs> and he says, well, isn't it obvious this is the longboat from Noah's Ark? So we carried out what we call a, uh, um, a probe excavation to try and better determine how well the boat uh, survived underneath the mud and to see if we could get a better handle on the date. You can see here that the level of the, that the water is fairly far away from the boat. Just keep that in mind. We'll get back to that. During this two-day probe, we found a cooking pot or casserole and an oil lamp, both of which could be dated to the early Roman period. That's from about mid-first century BC till about late first century AD. Uh, we couldn't be sure that the pottery actually dated the boat because we had no stratigraphy here. The cooking pot was found upside down right outside the boat uh, at the bow, and the oil lamp was found at a very high level inside the boat. We then closed, after that two days, it, it was clear that there was a lot more to do there. Uh, we reburied the boat, the, part, the small parts that we had excavated, and put stuff around the boat uh, to prevent people from driving over it because people were mudding, they were driving their cars over, and that's actually how the two brothers first got to this, uh, to this boat. Um, at that point, we wanted to keep it a secret in order to wait until the waters would come up again and we could do this as an underwater excavation. But news of the discovery got leaked to the press and that's, we finished the excavation on Friday. On Sunday, there was a little uh, blurb in Haaretz, one of the Israeli newspapers in Hebrew, on one of the back pages. It was only about an inch long and it said, a boat from the time of Jesus had been found in the Sea of Galilee. Well, that was okay, but the next day, all the newspapers in Israel and some international newspapers had frontline um, headlines saying, not a boat, but the boat of Jesus had been found in the Sea of Galilee. Now, I should point out that there is no such thing as the boat of Jesus. Jesus, didn't, to the best of our knowledge, didn't own a boat. He wasn't a boat's captain. Uh, but it, this idea of the Jesus boat, which is now what everybody but me calls it, pretty much, because uh, I don't think it's fair to the Christians. I don't think you should call it. We can't make a direct connection to Jesus with this boat. So uh, I will show you how it relates, but, but I don't think it's, it's the correct name for it. The, uh, but what happened was once that got out, uh, the, 
there's a legend in the um, Sea of Galilee, just as there is in just about every body of water, that there's a treasure wreck there. And the treasure wreck in the, in the Sea of Galilee is supposedly a Turkish boat or boat that sank during World War I. It was sunk by the British. And supposedly it had all this money that they were going to pay the Turkish troops in, um, in Palestina of the time. Now, uh, the story of the archaeologists trying to hide the boat together with the treasure of this other boat started getting, started getting mixed up. And we had people starting to wander the shores looking for the boat of Jesus full of gold coins. And it was quite obvious that if we didn't do something very quickly, some farmer, some ignoramus would come up with a, with a tractor and a shovel and basically destroy this entire boat looking for a treasure that didn't exist while destroying that, the treasure that did exist. So within a very few days, the department organized a uh, excavation of the boat, which I directed. This is the first night of the excavation. We, um, and this was really, a, I have to say, a gonzo excavation. It was uh, really flying by the seat of our pants. Nobody had ever excavated a boat, a ship in Israel at that time, and certainly not on land. But here you can see the uh, stern of the boat beginning to come out. It was located so that the stern was facing the land and the bow was facing uh, the water. During, in the morning, uh, just, as the, uh, just before sunup, the wind shifted and we started getting an easterly, what's called a sharkia, and started to blow the, uh, the water towards the boat. And what had happened by that time was that the water had come much closer to the boat because of all these rains that were happening at the time. And the Sharkia, the east wind, is the strongest wind. It's the wind that's mentioned twice in the Bible as the one that the seafarers fear the most. And in the Sea of Galilee, it comes down over the uh, Golan Heights and then flies across the water, and it can really cause huge waves on the west side of the lake. So we were really concerned that this was going to cause some harm. And you can see now, again, how close the water had now moved. All we had were a few uh, sandbags that we had scavenged from the nearby kibbutz. But fortunately, the night before, I had talked to people from the Canaret Authority, the, the uh, Israeli uh, group that's responsible for the Sea of Galilee, and I had actually asked if it was possible to lower the level of the lake of the Sea of Galilee, which in Israel is sort of tantamount to asking for open season on bald eagles in America. I mean, it's something you don't, it's absolutely off the wall, crazy. And we got a visit the night before by the head of the Canard Authority, and he said, you know, I got this request from the minister that's very strange, how, because we had ministers talking to each other at this point. And I said, well, you know, we want to save this boat. And he said, well, of course we can't lower the lake, but what we can do is come and build a dike for you. So next morning, just as the wind was starting to uh, really pick up, uh, they showed up with these uh, uh, caterpillar uh, tractors and, and sandbags and, and people and started in sandbags. And we, they built a dike around the excavation site, which held to the very end of the excavation site. And in the end, surprisingly, the rising of the water proved to be very providential for us, which I'll show you in a minute. As we were excavating the boat, the, uh, we had to be very careful to um, not remove the mud that was supporting it because the wood was waterlogged, which meant it had the, its structural strength had been lost, and it had the structural strength of something like wet floral foam. You could literally take a piece of the plank and go like this and mush it in your hands. So it could not support its own weight. And that's why you see we're digging around the boat. Uh, this, again, is that same line in the mud that you saw in that first slide, uh, but while leaving a podium to support the boat. At that point, the weather suddenly turned on us. It turned really balmy, uh, very balmy February. And uh, this was a problem because the the, water, the, the wood was waterlogged, which meant that what was holding the wood up at a cellular level was water. And if you have strong sunlight hitting that, it's going to start evaporating. The cells are going to start collapsing, and there's no way of pumping them back up again. So the first thing we did was we put two uh, iron bridges over the boat and then put a tarpaulin over it. First of all, that's like, sort of like uh, first aid to prevent the sun from hitting the boat directly. We then, as we were excavating inside the boat, we ran into a problem in that we were sort of like the man sitting on a tree, tr on a tree branch and sawing it off the trunk. 
because we could not, once we took the mud out of the bottom, we couldn't stand on that part of the hull because your foot would go right through it. So we had to come up with a way of excavating inside the boat without touching it. So what we did was lower a uh, hanging platform inside the boat so that people could lie there for hours excavating inside the boat without touching it. Again, our main concern was that the wood would not dry out. And uh, it's hard to see in this slide, but these people are looking at uh, this little water twizzler that that's, uh, was one of the way we were trying to, ways we were trying to keep the wood wet. While you're looking at the slide also, though, notice those white lines. That's, that's white plastic string that we strung between the planks to show the planking uh, plan. And you'll notice that there are a lot of very narrow uh, planks there. The, the planking plan really doesn't make sense. Uh, and we'll talk about that later also. As we're enlarging the pit around the boat, we, um, we were using a backhoe. We weren't in an archaeological site as best we knew. It was just this boat. So we were using very carefully, a, as carefully, careful as you can, a backhoe to remove the mud so that we could enlarge the trench around the boat so that we could get at it better. And as we're doing it, this gentleman behind me, whose name is Tfika Malach, uh, was one of the volunteers. He's a uh, farmer from the area, would work in his orchards in the mornings and then come out and work with us in the afternoons. But um, as the, the shovel would pick up a, a shovel load of mud, it would drop it in front of the two of us. And if there were any pieces of wood or, or artifacts, we would put them in those plastic uh, boxes that you can see there. At this point, more or less, and every so he got so into this that every so often I'd be pulling him away because you'd have this the shovel flying over our heads, and he just wasn't paying attention to it. At one point, he put his hand into the water, and we had groundwater coming up all the time. We had pumps going 24 hours a day to keep the water from filling the the uh, trench. He put his hand in the water. And he said, "Shelley, I can feel something's connected. There's some wood that's connected to here. It's not loose." So what uh, Tzvika had found was actually parts of two other boats that aren't related to our boat. And here you can see a frame attached to a plank, and here's another plank. So we excavated that for a bit and then removed parts of it and then reburied that area and went back to working on our boat because we had only so many resources we needed to focus really on the, the main uh, event. Now, it was really fortunate for us that perhaps the most, most fortuitous thing for us was that we were able to get J. Richard Steffi, it's the gentleman in the yellow shirt in the center of the photo, from Texas A&M University. This is what you would call the ultimate wood whisperer. This person can literally, he, he died uh, few, uh, recently, but uh, Dick was unbelievable with hulls. He could literally read the wood like you or I read a newspaper. He could tell you what the person who built the boat, what he was like, whether he kept his tools sharp, whether he was left-handed or right-handed. Unbelievable things. And um, we were very fortunate in getting him to study the hull because there was no one in Israel who was a hull reconstructor. This is something that, this is a new division of archaeology that he actually invented and created and literally wrote the book for. So we had the most expert person. And uh, I kept on telling the gang that we, where we were working, you know, Professor Steffi's coming from America and he'll be able to tell us everything. Well, uh, and we were working desperately to get the, he could only stay for a certain period of time and we had to get the inside of the hall clear so he could see it while he was there because it, his, one of his sons was getting married and his wife told him, if you don't come back for the wedding, don't bother coming back. So he had a hard, a hard date that he had to come back for. And that, so that was another one of the reasons that we were working, trying to work so fast. But the night he came, the day he came, by the time he got out to the site, it was already dark. And we would work up to 7 or 8 in the evening each night. And we had these uh, sort of, uh, not sort of, we had these uh, fishermen lanterns out. And it was this sort of clammy night. And he comes there, puts on his galoshes, and goes down into the pit and looks around. We're all standing there waiting for the, the word. And he looks around, he looks around, and he finally goes like this and walks out of the pit. And he says, OK, I can go back to the hotel now. And I said, Dick, you need to say something. Everybody's waiting. And he, he looks around and says, yep, it's an old boat. <laughs> you know, I, I, it's like, and, and everybody's looking at me like, uh, this is your expert. <laughs> yeah. But I, that's Dick. I mean, he, he, he knew he was pulling our legs that way. 
Uh, once Dick had had a chance to look at the hull, uh, the next question was, what do we do with it? And the solution was to move it. This is the site of the excavation. The decision was made to move it to the Igal Alone Museum. This is a museum in Kibbutz Ginosar, which you can see is nearby. It's about a kilometer away. And this was just being built at the time. And uh, it just seemed it, we had requests from all sorts of places to, for the boat to be exhibited there. But we all really felt that the boat should be exhibited where it spent its time. And we were delighted that, that this uh, structure could actually uh, take care of the boat and then that it, it really was providential. Well, the question was, how do we move the boat? Normally, in a Mediterranean excavation, you take the planks apart. And if there are iron nails, they've disintegrated because of the reaction with salt water. Um, the problem with our boat was she was telling us, she was holding on to her integrity with her nails. Literally, the nails uh, were so well conserved, so well preserved, that they had less than a millimeter of rust on them. This is because it was fresh water and anoxic. Uh, so the situation was that we realized we had to move the boat in one piece. But how do you move a boat that's about 27 feet long, and basically made out of wet floral foam, without the whole thing falling apart on you? Well, my uh, Conservator, Orna Cohen, came up with an idea that had never been tried before. But like I said, this was gonzo uh, archaeology. We decided that we were going to go with that. And the idea was, first of all, to between every two framing stations on the inside, we put fiberglass and resin frames. We placed uh, um, aluminum foil underneath them so that the water resin wouldn't stick to the wood. Once those were completed, we then uh, put a very fine film of plastic over the entire inside of the hull and spray filled it with polyurethane. Polyurethane is like styrofoam, but it sprays on as two, liquid, two liquids that, when they come in contact, release heat and foam up and then solidify. And this, was, this took place simply because we, we got to that point in the evening, so this happened at night also. And it was the most bizarre situation where it looked like the stuff was foaming up and just sort of take, eating the boat. And we joked that if they ever make a movie about this excavation, uh, Hollywood will call it the boat, the uh, blob eats the boat of Jesus. <laughs> so this is what the boat looked like after we had placed <laughs> the polyurethane in it. Um, and now the question was, how do we excavate the bottom of the hull? without having the whole thing collapse. Well, what we did was we excavated a row of uh, tunnels perpendicular to the boat's keel. And you can see the gentleman in the red hat there is just beginning the first tunnel. And this is a tunnel. We'd work from both ends. This was not a lot of fun. You were sitting in very cold, wet mud and digging away with this boat on top of you. And once the tunnel had been met from both sides, and they would be about this wide, uh, we could then run a fiberglass truss underneath the boat, attach it to the top, and then spray fill each of these tunnels with polyurethane, which we could then glue on to the polyurethane on top of the boat, forming a row of polyurethane uh, supports for the boat. And once we had completed one row, we could then repeat the process, and in doing so, completely encapsulate the boat in a cocoon of polyurethane without ever moving it an inch. And we were able also to add uh, two by fours there, you can see at the bottom, in order to give some structural strength to this whole thing. Now the question was, how do we uh, move it? Well, there were three possibilities. One was to move it out on a truck, but um, the way this boat was found was the brothers, as they were wandering around the uh, Sea of Galilee, looking, they had decided they were looking, they were going to look for an ancient boat. The way they found this was somebody had been driving a truck in this area and got stuck in the mud. And it had, that had kicked out some ancient coins. That's what got them to look in this area near the ancient site of Migdal. Well, so, that, so using a trailer was not a great idea on such a muddy area. Second possibility was to helicopter it out in the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces, the Air Force actually offered us a helicopter. But having ridden in some of these, the big helicopters really vibrate. And I was concerned that the vibrations would go down the wire, that the support wire, and might harm the boat. 
And then somebody from the Canard Authority came up to me and said, well, you know, polyurethane floats, you've got a lake here, which part of this isn't clear? So uh, what we did was pump the water. We, we had these pumps going, like I said, keeping the groundwater out the whole time. We reversed the pumps and filled the, uh, filled the pit with, ground wa with water. Meanwhile, we brought a steam shovel up. And once the boat was floating free, and you can see this was quite a media event, um, we then had the steam shovel dig a channel through to the Sea of Galilee, and away we went. And here we got stuck on a sandbar. But we got past it, and for the first time in 2,000 years, the boat sailed the Sea of Galilee, give or take. It then took us about a day to figure out how to build a lifting platform that we could put under the boat in order to lift it onto land and then lift it into the pool that we were going to build to conserve it, but then be able to remove the lifting platform. That took about a day, and we came up with some really Rube Goldberg ideas for doing that. In the end, we just had this, uh, these two, um, two rails attached with two other metal rails, and, it just, uh, and everything was just bolted together, put the boat on it, lifted it ashore, and you can see there, this is the boat coming ashore, and right next to it, that rectangle of white is where the pool is going to be built. We didn't want to build the pool until the boat was physically on land, because quite honestly, to the last minute, we weren't sure that we were going to succeed. So we didn't want to spend money on the pool if we were not going to succeed in getting the boat. I should just mention that the whole excavation from that first day to moving it, uh, getting it on land was 11 days and nights. So we then uh, had a break while for 10 days, uh, it took 10 days to build the conservation pool. And then we had the uh, boat placed in the pool and not without uh, incident, uh, at this point the, uh, the crane shifted and the boat almost fell into the pool. Previously I told the crane operator, please be careful, this isn't a pile of bricks, this is something unique and valuable, and he turned to me and said, oh, don't worry, I know exactly what I'm doing. Well, I've learned when anybody tells you that, be sure, that's when you start worrying. Uh, we had two people inside the pool. Fortunately, as soon as something happened, I told him, get the boat, move the boat back out. We sent him packing. Next day, brought in a different crane operator who managed to put it in, in the pool. At that point, uh, we filled the pool halfway with water. I went in uh, and unbolted the, um, the different pieces of the support system because the boat was now floating above it. We removed those, pumped the water out, so now we had the boat in the pool without anything underneath it. And at this point, we suddenly realized that in our rush to put the polyurethane on, we had not really thought how we were going to take it off again. <laughs> and this resulted in the second excavation of the Canard boat. And everybody brought their own knife. One person wanted to bring a turkey carver, uh, an electric turkey carver, but we realized that polyurethane has cyanide in it, so we thought heating it up was probably not a good idea in a semi-closed environment. Uh, if you look at our faces here, you can see how depressed we were. At this point, we thought we were losing the boat. We couldn't fill the pool with water until we had gotten all the polyurethane off, uh, but it was taking a long time to get it off. We didn't have all the volunteers who had been working with us during the excavation. But uh, we did have some core people there, and we just kept on working. And to make a very long and arduous story short, we did get the boat back in water uh, and basically saved it. So uh, that's the adventure part of the story. Here is a photograph of some of the people who, not all, because we can never get everybody in one photograph, but this is most of the people who took part in the excavation. And everybody who took part really felt they had, you know, you could not, you could not, this was really a unique experience that everybody, uh, I think, will remember to the day they die. Um, once the boat was in the pool, the department built a structure over the pool. The boat was in the right part of this, and you can see where that little uh, dark rectangle is. That part, there was a walk through. Has, was anybody, did anybody visit the boat while it was in the pool? Anybody? So you'll remember this. This, You would walk through, there was a glass there, and you could see the pool. And for the longest time, you couldn't see anything because it was being conserved in this liquid. Uh, and you literally could not see anything, and people would still come by and, and look at where the boat was. But this was very important because the money from that allowed us to conserve the boat. 
And of course, one, at one point I got a tourist asking me, well, this is all a great story, but what I don't understand is how did you get the boat through the doors here? <laughs> Uh, this is on the left, you can see the boat in the pool getting ready for its 10 year long bath of polyethylene glycol or PEG. This is the uh, material that's used to replace the water in the wood cells through a process of heating and osmosis. As you, as you leave, you basically boil the wood in, uh, in this liquid, a high uh, percentage of this liquid, and the, the, these uh, synthetic wax cell. Um, molecules manage to infiltrate the wood and replace the uh, water. And then eventually, when the percentage is high enough, you can then remove the polyethylene glycol, dry off the rest of the peg. You can see on the right here, it's after at the end of the process. This is after 10 years. It was 11 days to excavate, but 10 years to conserve. Uh, you then have to clean off the excess wax, because it literally looks like you had dipped it in wax, which is basically what had been done. And the conservators would sit there for, for months using a woman's hair dryer and rags and just wiping off the excess, um, the excess wax. Uh, when we come to the detective story, one of the most important things is when did this boat date to? And usually ships, uh, shipwrecks are easy to date because if you have a cargo, you date the cargo. In this case, there was, there was very little inside this boat. It seemed to have been a derelict at, in, when it was left in the lake. <clears throat> one, of the, but one of the good things we had was we had a lot of wood, so we could do radiocarbon dates, and we did a number of radiocarbon dates. We also had some pottery, these two pieces that I showed you, plus some other ones, some of them no bigger than your thumbnail, but they were diagnostic for the, an expert who I brought in whose expertise was specifically uh, uh, pottery from this period in the galley. Plus, we had the construction of the boat itself. So when I came to write the excavation report, which came out in 1990, uh, one of the things I did was ask Dick Steffi, if you had found this boat in the Mediterranean, based on the hull construction, when would you date it to? And he said, well, it would probably be somewhere between 100 BC and AD 200. Um, then with the radiocarbon dates, we got a date of 40 BC plus minus 80, which gives you somewhere between 120 BC and, plus, and AD 40. Now you have to remember that this gives the date of the cutting of the wood, not the date of the sinking of the ship, of the boat. Plus, as I'll show you, there is some reason to believe that this, wor this wood has been reused in one, another boat and possibly more than one boat. So that the dates here may be sort of slanted early. They, they may be needed to be pushed down. At least I think the, the more reliable date is the later dates here. Then we have the pottery, which again dates from somewhere between 50 BC to around AD 70. The site where the boat was found is Migdal. Who, here, who came from Migdal? Who famous from the New Testament? Anybody? Mary Magdalene. Mary from Migdal. Uh, Migdal was destroyed by the Romans in AD 67, so probably whatever was going on here ceased after AD 67 in this time range. So it's probably somewhere between eight, uh, 50 BC and around 67 uh, AD. So when we put these all together in the uh, excavation report, I proposed that the date is somewhere between, for this boat, it lived its life sometime between 100 BC and AD 70. Now that doesn't mean it was on the lake for 170 years. It was probably usable for maybe 10 years or uh, perhaps a little bit more than that. But it, it's somewhere within that time range. Another thing we learned about the boat, and this is from Dick Steffi's study, is that this, is an old, this literally is an old boat. It's not just an old boat for us, it was an old boat when it got into the lake. And one of the ways we know that is that there are a lot of repairs to this boat. Uh, some of them are, are as prosaic as metal staples. These things are about yay big. They look big there, but they're only about this big. And they're placed across planking seams where the mortise and tenon joints had begun to weaken. We also found an interesting phenomenon here in which the uh, pieces of the boat had been removed in antiquity. Here you're looking at the inside the bow of the boat. You can see a sort of uh, darkened area here. This is a frame station. It's where there had been a frame or a rib. 
And you can even see these nails sticking out. Now, the frame hadn't rotted away. Somebody had literally yanked it out in antiquity. Again, here we are looking in one of the tunnels that we dug underneath the boat. And you can see these three items here. OK, here's your, your uh, flash quiz. What are these? They're mortise and tenon scars. What are they doing here? Absolutely nothing. This is a reused piece of wood. And here we go at the stern. And here you can see what's called a scarf. This is a locking mechanism that attaches the keel that's coming out on the right there. And it would have locked into the stern post, but the stern post is gone. What happened to it? It didn't rot away. Somebody removed it in antiquity. Um, and in fact, Dick even pointed out to me that up here, he could see signs of a um, pliers that somebody had used to remove the nails so that they could remove these pieces. So what's going on? One other piece of information, then we'll get back to why this is interesting. There are 12 different types of wood in this boat. Now, different types of wood are used in hull construction for different purposes. But as you can see from, the plan, from, the, from this plan, these timbers are used wherever. Uh, some are used for repairs. Um, for the most part, the hull, the planking, was made out of Lebanese cedar, which does not grow locally. Uh, all the others do grow locally. And, in, and if you visit the uh, boat in Israel, uh, one of the really nice things that they've done is they built a uh, row, they uh, planted a row of trees so that every single tree you, uh, type of wood used in the boat is on this entrance to the, as you walk into the museum with the identity of that wood. I think it's a really beautiful thing. The uh, keel itself was made out of three different parts, three different pieces of wood, each one of a different type of wood. Um, when you put all of this together, the pieces that are being removed from the hull, the pieces that are being reused in the hull, and I remind you of that early shot of the people looking at the water sprinkler and the narrow planking, all that suggests that these, this boat was built out of bits and pieces of older boats. Or, or an older boat that was that were were that was taken off and reused, possibly more than once. Um, Dick Steffi, on the first day when he came to look at the boat, he got really annoyed. He, he would take these things personally. He got very annoyed at the ancient boat builder, and he said, "This guy doesn't know what he's doing. Look at this planking scheme. It's absolutely ridiculous. This is really annoying." And he just went off in a huff. And the next day, he came back with his beatific smile, and he said, "You know, I was totally wrong." This is an expert boat builder, but he was working with inferior materials. This is all he had. And I keep telling people when I give lectures in, in churches, this is a great source of a sermon, I think. You know, building something from nothing. This is literally uh, taking bits and pieces of wood that on the Mediterranean coast would have been used for kindling wood and building a boat out of it that could be used. This is also extremely interesting when you read Josephus or the uh, Josephus, the first century AD Jewish historian, or the Gospels, and you read about how people are being overtaxed and they don't have money and they're very poor. Well, somebody who owned a boat like this was not at the bottom of the social, of the economic food chain. This is somebody who could hire people, as we know from the Gospels. So to see that this is what somebody who had some money, what he was using, it really hits home the poverty that these people were, were experiencing under the taxation of the Roman uh, uh, administration. One of the most memorable moments for me during the excavation was the first day that Dick arrived. And he came over to me after a while, after he had a chance to look at the hull. And he said, this is, this is a later, uh, this is the drawing that we published. It's his lines drawings. It's showing the, the boat three-dimensionally in three views. Um, but he said, this is what I think the boat looked like. It would have had a, a cutwater bow, which you can see at the in sort of uh, dashes at the right side, it would have a recurving stern. And I said, well, how many oarsmen do you think would have, this boat would have had? And he said, well, I figure this size boat probably two to a side. I said, uh, do you think it had a sail? And he said, well, I haven't found a mast step. A mast step is what you put under a mast so that the pressure of the wind doesn't translate straight into the hull. 
He said, but, but I did find out at the center of the hull there were four nail holes and a discoloration, which means that there had been a, a mast step there, but somebody had removed it in antiquity. So the answer is yes, there would have been a mast here. There would have, it would have also been able to, use as a, to be used to sail it. He goes away. Five minutes later, I get a visit by two Franciscan archaeologists who were excavating it right next door at Migdal, and they come over, and I show them around the boat, and they said, uh, you know, they, not to be outdone, they say, well, you know, we have an ancient boat also. And I said, oh, really? I thought this was the first one. He said, no, no, this one is in a mosaic, a first century AD mosaic. And I said, oh, that's really exciting. Maybe it represents the same type of boat. Please draw it for me. And what they drew was basically identical to what Dick had just described to me. Here's the, uh, what has become known as the Migdal boat mosaic. Now, this might not represent a boat. It might represent a model of a boat. But for our case, it really doesn't matter. Here you've got the cutwater bow that he was talking about, the recurving stern. And uh, when I asked them how many oars it, this boat had, they said, well, it had three oars. And I thought, well, I, I said, well, maybe, maybe this is a bigger boat than ours because we think ours would only have three oars. Well, after the excavation, I went back and was preparing the excavation report, and this was before the days of Photoshop and electronic photography and all that. So in order to draw this mosaic, I projected it on a piece of paper on my refrigerator and began drawing each of the tesserae, each of the uh, stones. When I got to the stern, I literally jumped up in the air because I noticed that the stern oar widens at the bottom. In other words, it's not an oar, it's a quarter rudder. And this, in other words, there would have been four rowers, like Dick had predicted, and a helmsman captain. And even if it had two quarter rudders, it would have had one person steering it. Well, this, if I was living in a cartoon world, you would have seen a, a big light bulb go off near my head. Why? Because one of the big questions for this excavation report was, we have stories of boats on the Sea of Galilee, we have a, a representation of a type of boat, and we have our boat. But how do we make the connect? Is there a connection here? Is this the type of boat mentioned by, by in the um, Gospels? Is this the type of boat mentioned by Josephus when he talks about things happening during the Jewish war on the Sea of Galilee? And the light bulb was, it's crew size. Let's look at the crew size. What, can we learn anything from what Josephus tells us? or what the Gospels tell us about how many people crewed the boats that are described there. Well, uh, the first thing I went to was Josephus, and he describes a situation which, the, uh, for some unclear reason, the zealots had decided to put, make him head of the Jewish revolt in the Galilee. Why they would put somebody like that in charge, not clear. But at one point, he was at Migdal, which was one of the bases for the revolt. And Roman uh, soldiers, Roman cavalry had arrived at Tiberius. And Tiberius didn't want to have anything to do with the revolt. They wanted to stay peaceful. And they were about to go over to the Romans. The problem was this was a, uh, J uh, Josephus had just sent his army off for a weekend R&R. &R, and he only had seven soldiers with him. So he, he devised a ruse. There were many boats at Migdal that the, the, that the rebels had kept with the idea of either attacking or escaping from the Romans. So he collected these, and this is what he says. Then Josephus collected all the boats that he could find on the lake, some 230, with no more than four sailors in each, and with this fleet made full speed for Tiberius. Well, when he got to Tiberius, he kept most of the boats far away from shore, and the Tiberians thought this was a war fleet full of soldiers who were coming to kill them. Uh, rebel soldiers that were coming to kill him. So Josephus was able to trick the Tiberians into giving hostages and getting on these boats. And what he says then is that as the boats were successively filled with these hostages, he ordered the captains to make with all speed to Tarichai. Tarichai is the Greek name for migdal, it means salted fish in Greek. So here we can make an equation, four sailors and one helmsman captain, five-man crew. This is the same type, but he's talking about the same type of boat that we found that is in the Migdal Mosaic. When we move to the Gospels, <clears throat> we get to Mark 1, where Jesus is walking along the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and uh, I'll just read it. He went a little farther on and saw two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, 
They were in the boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called them. They left their father in the boat with the hired men and went with Jesus. Well, we can turn this also into an equation. One James, one John, one Zebedee, two or more hired men give you a crew of five or more. Zebedee had the same type of boat. The only other specific boat we hear about is that of Simon Peter in John 21. And here, after the crucifixion, he goes out fishing uh, with six other disciples, making a crew of seven. Um, and, uh, of course, if you're going to fish, you need more people than just a rowing crew. So, again, we can say that Simon Peter also had a boat of this type. During the excavation, we kept on asked, being asked, could uh, G Jesus and the 12 apostles, could 13 people have gotten into this boat? And we kept on backing off and saying, well, we don't know, and we don't know, and we don't know. And, of course, Dick, with his wry sense of humor, one night at our, one of our meetings, comes in, and he's looking really serious, and he says, you know, I've just calculated how many people could get into this boat. Oh, Dick, tell us, how many people? And he says, well, I figured 12 people could get into the boat, and one would have to walk alongside. <laughs> but actually, what's interesting is, despite all the paintings of Jesus and the 12 apostles in the boat together, paintings and, and statues and whatnot, uh, in fact, if you read the Gospels carefully, it never says that he was in the boats with the, in any of these voyages that are recorded with the apostles. It says he was in the boats with the disciples. The apostles were chosen from the disciples, so there's no way of knowing from the gospel stories how many people were actually in the boat. But here Josephus comes to our help, our aid in learning how many people actually could be in this boat. Because when he's talking about the boat he was in when he goes to Tiberias in the Sham fleet, he says, I also went on board one of these boats with my friends and the seven-armed men already mentioned and sailed for Tiberias. So here we've got one Josephus, seven-armed men, two or more friends, four sailors, and one helmsman captain gives you 15 men on the boat. Just to show you that this is not an exaggeration, when he's talking about the first boat that is taking hostages from Tiberias, he says... Ten citizens, the principal men of Tiberias, that once came down. These he took aboard one of the vessels and carried out to sea. Well, obviously, the ten men weren't there by themselves. There was also a five-man crew. So again, you've got 15 men in the boat. So the answer is, had Jesus and the apostles actually wanted to sail in one of these boats, they could have. But that raises the question of how much did 15 males weigh? <laughs> and I took this question to uh, a... Um, uh, physical anthropologist Joe Zias, who at the time was working for the Department of Antiquities, and I said, how much did people weigh in those days? And he said, well, guess what, Shelley? We can't weigh people from those days anymore. But uh, as I was looking crestfallen, he said, but, you know, there are certain uh, equations that, that exist between how tall people are and how much, on average, they would weigh. And I'm sure you're familiar with this if you had anything to do with life insurance. Um, Adults, adult males, uh, skeletons that were found in the Galilee, presumably Jewish uh, adult males, their average height was five foot four and a half inches or 166 centimeters. Uh, now, current medical data for U.S. males today would uh, then give people like that a weight range of around 137 to 148 pounds or 62 to 57 kilograms. Uh, as we can imagine, that the, this population was probably thinner than uh, the uh, supersized generation that we live in today. Uh, they were probably of lighter build, so we can probably suggest that, say, around 140 pounds would be the, the, the likely top limit of how much they weighed. And if you multiply that, you get that's what you get, and it works out for a boat. Now, another thing that while all the, uh, in the um, press, everybody was talking about the boat of Jesus, in the excavation, we were thinking this might be a boat from the Battle of Migdal. This is a battle that Josephus describes, very bloody. 6,000 Jews were killed at the end of it. In, uh, this is a battle in which first there was a battle outside the city of Migdal uh, on the... Um, the Roman forces led by Titus, the son of Vespasian, both of whom later became emperors. And then once the, the, um, the battle was lost to the Jews, they ran inside the city. And Titus, with his cavalry, swam their horses around the 
walls that protected the city on the land side, and that's how they got into the city and began slaughtering the Jews inside the city. But then some of the Jews managed to make it onto these boats, the same boats that Josephus used in, the sham, in his sham fleet, and headed out into the lake. The next day, uh, Josephus tells us, uh, Vespasian ordered certain craft to be built, and he, could, he uses the Greek term schedia, which is usually translated as a raft. It's the, what, uh, what um, Odysseus uh, built when he wanted to get away uh, from, from, thank you. Um, but when you read the description by Josephus, it's obvious that these are not just uh, uh, you know, uh, Tom Sawyer type rafts because they're very quick, they're agile, they can attack the other boats. So in the excavation report, I would propose that probably what we're talking about here is that the Romans took boats like ours and built uh, catamarans out of them with a fighting platform out over them and then headed out into the battle. The only evidence that we have for this today are these coins. Some of the Judea Capta coins, the coins that were minted by the Flavian emperors, have the emperor standing on the bow of a ship. And these are Judea Capta. They're, there's, they're the coins commemorating the capture of Judea in AD 70. And since there aren't a lot of cases in which there were naval battles between the Jews and the Romans, it's possible that this is actually a memory of the Battle of Migdal. During the excavation, because we were digging day and night, and I was concerned that we were, and we were pulling up the mud in clumps, I was concerned that we might miss artifacts. So I went to the rather extreme uh, edge of things and had, and recorded the mud as artifacts, and took it away in these boxes. It, all the mud inside the boat, we recorded exactly where it came from and within a meter around the boat and then dumped it in a field nearby with numbers in each uh, pile of mud. The most ar important artifact we came up with was this uh, pyramidal iron arrowhead. And what's interesting about it is it's this, it is just like some of the arrowheads found at Gamla, which was the next site that the Romans attacked after Migdal. And in this area here, there's a very interesting description by Josephus of this battle also. He talks about how they broke through the the wall, but in this area, in the, in the red circle there, they found something like 1,200 arrowheads. And some of them are almost identical to what you can see the one uh, on the bottom, the second from the left at the bottom is almost identical to the one that we found. So it seems fairly likely that that arrowhead may have come from the Battle of Migdal. But again, this does not force the boat to be from the Battle of Migdal. Uh, in fact, when we put all the evidence together, what it looks like is this is an old boat that had served its time on the lake, and when the captain realized that he probably couldn't get through another winter, he brought it ashore somewhere where boats were being repaired and, and or built, and basically gave it in as a trade-in, so that all the reusable wood could be taken off and used on his new boat. And this was basically, this vessel was then pushed into the lake, it, the bow was sitting on a, was found to be sitting on a tree trunk. And it's not that the tree had grown there, it's rather somebody had put a tree trunk underneath it so that the boat was lying at an angle like this with the bow high and the stern down. And that's why if you look at the uh, lines drawing, you'll see that the, we have less of the bow than the stern because less was buried in the mud because the bow was being held up by that, uh, by that tree trunk. So this was basically sort of like a jalopy next to a garage, and it was probably used there for taking spare parts whenever you needed one, until there was some event, which must have happened fairly soon after the boat was put in the lake, when there was a lot of sediment that buried the boat to the point that it was not usable anymore, and it was forgotten until it was found by the two brothers. Now, when I came to the uh, States in 1990, I wanted to keep a connection to the boat, but it's a bit hard when you're on the other side of the world. So I had one of my students, one of my graduate students, this is uh, Bill Charlton, build a 1 to 10 scale model, not a replica, but a model of a generic Sea of Galilee fishing boat based on all the evidence we had from the boat, from iconography, and from ethno ethnography. And, um, 
This boat is ne this model is now exhibited next to the uh, boat itself. It was donated to the museum, and that character that you can see standing there is is two scale, five foot, four and a half inches. Primarily, it was probably used for fishing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. It also, as we know from both Josephus and the Gospels, it could be used to transport people and supplies, and basically anything to earn money. Now, one of the interesting things is what type of net was most likely used with this boat. And uh, we have this reference, this uh, parable of Jesus to heaven being like a net. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. Well, Jesus is not passing moral judgment on fish. What he's saying is they kept the kosher fish, which were marketable, and threw away the non-kosher fish, which were not marketable. In this case, the only non-kosher fish would be a catfish. Uh, but the type of net that he's talking about here is the seine net. It, that's actually the term that's used uh, in uh, that passage. The seine net works so that it's a long, narrow net with uh, lines at either end, uh, weights at one at the bottom, floats at the top. And the way you use it is by finding a shoal of fish that are clustering near the shore. And then you drop some people off with one side of the net. You slowly roll, uh, roll out, letting paying out the net, and try to encompass the, the net, encompass the fish, so that you catch the fish between the net and the shore. And then you pull, you, you drop the boat off at the other side. Everybody jumps out of the boat. And you pull the net ashore. And that is the type of net that was probably used with this boat. It's a very big and heavy net. And what's one of the interesting things is that they had boats of about this size used with that type of net on the Sea of Galilee up until the 1920s. They were called Arabia boats. One of the elements that they had there was that they had a big stern deck. We don't have that in the Sea of Galilee boat because it, 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 it was probably removed. Dick felt that there was some evidence in the way that the frames were aligned that there had been a uh, stern deck there because it's, it's virtually impossible to use a uh, same net if you have to pick it up from the bottom of the hull. But this also might explain another reference in the Bible when uh, in the uh, New Testament when Jesus is sleeping in the boat and one of the references he's he's sleeping in the stern on the pillow. Well if he's sleeping in the stern where would he be sleeping underneath that deck that would be the quietest place. Now what is the pillow? The best explanation that I've heard so far is sometimes in, re in recent memory when you're sailing with these types of boats, you would have sandbags with which you could ballast the boat. And these were known in Arabic as Mahadad Zabura or Kis Zabura. Kis Zabura means a sandbag. Mahadad Zabura means a, a, a sand pillow. And I've, I've got it on good uh, authority of people who have actually used them that occasionally people would go to sleep on them and use them as pillows. So that might explain that reference also. So that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, sure. Any questions? Yes. I wonder why you didn't, as soon as you saw that little piece sticking out at the very beginning, do the radio carbon dating so you know whether you're dealing with it, Radio carbon dating takes a while. Yeah, it's not something you hand in and get an answer. It's not something you stick in and get, a, get an answer. Uh, and these are things, in, and it costs money. And at that time, the Department of Antiquities, when we wanted to, just to give you an idea of how hard up we were for money, when I told the head of the department that we needed to call Dick Steffi to uh, come to the excavation, he said, well, we'll write him a letter. We couldn't afford to make a, a long-distance telephone call. So that, that just gives you an idea of where we were at. So radiocarbon dating only came way, way later, and it was done for free when people, because there was enough publicity about the bone. So yeah, yeah, it would be in the best of all worlds that would be a great way to do it, but but uh, on the ground that that would not have worked. That's it. Yes. I think it's like the modern food because they use on the. Uh... I'm sorry, I didn't hear. And there's like the modern food because they use on the Nile? Uh, in hull construction, no. Uh, today, 
there aren't a lot of places where you have frame first, where you have uh, shell first construction, and the sail there is different also. It's called a latine sail. It's, um, it's a sail that allows you better to sail into the wind than the square sail that this one's using. So um, They're different in that aspect. The one thing that I found common with those boats was when I was trying to figure out how long one of these boats could have lived on the Sea of Galilee. And the closest parallels I found were Egyptian boats, which usually, which usually on the freshwater Nile will last for around 10 years. So. Yes? Just what I told you, that, that Dick had seen, and you can't see it now, apparently it's been erased by the preservation, the conservation treatment. He had seen in the center of the, of the uh, keel, on the top of the center of the keel, a discoloration like I showed you at the bow there where the, the frame had been removed, and four holes where there would have been nails. That's all we had. We had the, the um, shadow of it. So the, the having a mast step then tells you that it would have had a mast. And then you can, you can relate that also to the mosaic showing the ship with a mast. Yes? Can you explain how the fishing net works again? I didn't quite get it. The sea net? The sea net, right. Okay, the sea net is a long, narrow net with ropes on either side. The bottom of the net, there are weights. On the top of the net, there are floats. You have it in the stern of the boat. You see a shoal of fish near shore. You go to one end of the, sho of the shoal, or a bit farther away from it. You drop off some men very quietly so that you don't scare the fish. And they're holding one end of the, of the net. You then go out, to, out into the water slowly dropping out the net, trying to get the fish between the net and the shore. Once you get to the other side, you just pull the boat ashore, everybody leaves the boat, and you pull the net onto shore from both sides. That's why Jesus is saying when they pull the, sh the net ashore. And he actually uses the term, he doesn't say net, he says segena, which is the Greek for a seine net. Yes? When you discovered, I think, on the picture, the top part that was sticking out, how long did it take you to figure out what part of the boat you were looking at? We know that well, we could see that it went sort of like this, and the, where I showed you where we did that section to see if, the, if there were mortise and tendon joints was more or less in the middle. It, it was an area where already either the brothers had moved around or there was, you know, it was where we had to do the least amount of work to get there. But it was more or less in the middle of the house. Yes. Um, thank you for bringing up the, uh, the description from Mark IV. Actually, Can you? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Thank you for bringing up the description from Mark IV because I was actually going to ask you about if he's asleep in the stern. Uh, is there a chance that maybe there, there could just be another type of boat design we just haven't discovered where there wasn't a stern deck, or has that been proposed? The, the bottom line is anything is possible because uh, one of the things you have to remember with history, and this is something I think it's real words of wisdom that people don't think about. It was said by Nancy Sanders who, in her book on the Sea Peoples that history in a way uh, distorts the past because we have these small bits of information. We have the, we're told about certain people and yet everybody around them who existed become invisible to us because we have this Klieg light on, on these people. Now, there, so other things are possible. Could there be other boats on the lake? That was a question that I raised with Dick. And I, I always, can, I think everybody who know in the field considers Dick the ultimate authority on these things. The thing he pointed out was that on most lakes, you'll have a certain type of boat that will develop that will be proper for what is needed on that lake. And even if the construction changes, like it did between our boat and the Arabia boat, more or less the shape, more or less the use remains the same. And there usually isn't more than one boat doing the same thing on, on a given body of water. Now, you might have a smaller boat, and they're in the, uh, I wrote two books. On, there's the excavation report and a popular book on the boat. And in both of them, I propose that there may be some evidence for a sort of a rowboat, smaller type boat. But I don't think there's another type of boat other than this one. There probably wasn't another type of boat other than this one on the lake for that size. Now, 
You might have got a bigger one or a small one, but that's the basic shape. Yes? What happened to the other boats that you had found parallel to it? We rem the thing was this, that I would have loved to continue burrowing, you know, excavating those. Once we found them, we moved the shovel off and we excavated about the yay much of them. And then we just removed what we had, record recorded it, photographed it, drew it, removed it, and put sandbags over the area and went back to working on the boat because I just did not have enough ability to deal both with the boat and this thing over here. And at a certain point, you just have to say, this is my main goal and this is what I'm going to work on. Now, in 1992, I tried to organize, I organized a project to go back and look for boats, boats of the uh, Battle of Migdal. And up until 1992, the drought that had started in 1986, the lake had been totally dry. As soon as I decided to do that, there was snow, there was water, the lake filled up. It had never been that high. They had a let water, they literally had a let water out. So instead of doing a, a land walking survey and, and looking back at those remains that I wanted to look at, I did a bottom penetrating sonar survey with a boat. And uh, the problem with that was we found that the Sea of Galley has a lot of methane gas. And for a bottom penetrating sonar, it can look through rock and sand and mud and whatever you want. When it gets to bubbles, it just bounces off. So we didn't get very far with that. Uh, and when we went back to the site where the boat was excavated, some trees had grown there, and we got the bottom penetrating sonar in a underwater survey stuck on a tree. So, but I, but I, to answer that, I, in in general, when there's one, there's more. So I, I'm convinced that there are more boats down there that relate to the Battle of Migdal, but I don't think we should. Even if we found one, I wouldn't recommend excavating it and removing it because the Sea of Galilee boat is what I call a holy grail. It's a boat that adds 100% new knowledge. It's like uh, the Ulebrone shipwreck, if you heard Jamal Pulak's uh, talk. This is a ship that adds 100% new knowledge. If we were to excavate another boat from the Sea of Galilee of the same type, we would add 5% new knowledge. I think that that, I would rather go out and find another type of boat that is a holy grail. So. Yes? Could you speak up, please? Could you make a comparison with the preservation of this boat and this boat? The Vaza? Yeah. The Vaza is much bigger. This would be sort of a long boat for that boat. The timbers are made out of oak, which is very strong. You could literally walk on them from the moment they took it out of the water. Uh, so you have a lot greater, pro a much bigger problem in getting the polyethylene glycol to to get through, the wood's just so dense that you can't, you can't get it through. And now they're having, I don't know exactly the details, but they're having some kind of problems with sulfates or sulfides that are coming out. It was so big that they couldn't immerse it. They, they sort of showered it with polyethylene glycol for years. Um, they've stopped that, but I know that there are some problems with the conservation. With us, it basically the boat was small enough that we could just put it in a, a tub and fill it with polyethylene glycol. And the wood was much thinner and uh, much more waterlogged and less dense. 